Blog Talk Radio. Hello, this is the girl George and the Dragons Radio Show. Today we have an old friend of mine from K San Radio. He used to be the night disc jockey there back in oh seventy six to about seventy eight or so. And he was the coolest uh, disc jockey. Actually, I started guard. in seventy two. Oh, well, uh, that's when I knew you was 76. Right, so you started right. case in at 72. This is Norman Davis. Hello, Norman. Hello. <laughs> so you started case in in 72? Yeah, just barely got there in time to make the Norman Orr poster, the famous one about case in. Uh-huh. So, so uh, when did you start radio altogether? Oh my gosh! It was, it was back there when Marconi was <laughs> was doing his thing. Well, maybe a little later than that. But um, I tell you, I got interested in radio as a small child because that was before television, and radio was magic in its golden years. You know, there was everything that they now have on TV and more. And because you used your imagination instead of a computer or a television screen, uh, it it really was uh, more powerful, I think. Yeah, the power of the voice and your imagination. You had to use your imagination. Right? Oh, yeah. And then there were so many opportunities to do that. Radio was just full of variety programs of all kinds. And from morning till night, and uh, so I I had a very religious mom, and so I had to uh, carefully <laughs> pick when I could listen to uh, radio. But um, occasionally I'd play sick and stay home uh, when all the kids' serials were on. You know, they were like Tom Mix and Sky King and Captain Midnight, and and there were many others. And they would run a block of that kind of programming at certain hours in the afternoon. So I really got hung up on radio way back then. So where are you from originally? Uh, Well, um, from all over, really. Um, I... uh, we lived in Wyoming when I was first born, and then we moved to Idaho, and I grew up pretty much there until uh, I left home and started working in radio. So you're back in Idaho again? I am, and I, actually I'm I'm using the same room for a bedroom that I did when I was eight years old. <laughs> The house has been in the family a long time. (laughs) What kind of work did your father do? Uh, Dad was um, kind of an all-purpose guy. He was good at mechanics and carpentry, and he drove truck for a while. And then for the last 25 or 30 years, he worked uh, either in the paint shop or uh, he he eventually became supervisor of the company garage, and uh, that's what he, what he retired from eventually. Okay, how old were you when you first got your first job in radio, and where was it at? Uh, okay, um, I think I think I was nineteen. And I might have been 20, but it was close in there. And uh, I had started out in uh, Boise on a, a station called KGEM. It was a um, high-power AM station, as were most of the stations then. And uh, um, it's a long story I won't bore you with, but my initial... What year was that? Was that when rock and roll was happening? What year was it? Uh, like 54... So that was before rock and roll, or just when it was, it was like your hip happen, parade you know. type of thing, huh? <laughs> Red uh, Silt and the Sunset, and <laughs> Canadian, Canadian. Oh yeah, well, but you know there was still remnants of the swing era, 
which yeah. had been a pretty hip time uh, for popular music, and oh, yeah. so there were still yeah. some big bands and was and the rhythm some and decent blues music. Was the rhythm what? and blues? Rhythm and blues back well, then. Well, there the only place that would happen would be you know maybe in Chicago, but it would be only stations like catering to African Americans that would even consider something like that. But down in New Orleans and Memphis and places like that, there were stations. But I didn't get exposed to any of that. I mean, the first blues I uh, heard were like Ray Charles and uh, some of the things that became hits, and so I would hear them on the radio. And I didn't really know they were blues, (laughs) but uh, (laughs) later I discovered they were. And I've been doing a blue show of one kind or another since, um, I think, 1991. We're up in Idaho. So I've acquired, so I've acquired quite a few promos in that time. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever work as Tom Donahue? Yeah, uh, Tom was uh, still around, and he was the boss at... Uh, case then until I think he died in 75 so there were two or three years that I worked there with Tom and then I had worked with Tom before up at KYA oh, I remember uh, that station uh, had, that's the one I used to listen to when I was a teenager with KYA yeah, from the Bay Area and it wasn't KEWB huh? well I've listened to that one too but I think KYA <laughs> is the one that sticks in my head the most yeah, they were our main competition uh, when we got started. But uh, KYA was uh, just a terrible station with no dis- definable uh, direction until um, uh, they hired Les Crane to come in and act as program director. And uh, he was from Philadelphia. And he immediately hired uh, several escapees from the payola scandal that was <laughs> sweeping the nation then. So that's when Tom Donahue and Bobby Mitchell and Peter Tripp and maybe another guy or two came out and uh, made San Francisco home. Did you ever meet Moon Doggy? Who? The guy that started the whole thing, what was his name? You it's, know, the one oh, that got that, that, that busted started from... KYA. No, 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 no. The one named Rock and Roll. They called the guy the that started Dog. Rock and Roll. Yeah, yeah, the one that got busted for the for the. You mean payroll. Alan Freed? Yeah, him. <laughs> well, okay, but let me correct you on something. Alan Freed did not invent the term rock and roll. Uh, well, in history books, it always been, says that. Yeah, I know, but they're wrong because uh, if you go back, you can find the term rock and roll mentioned in songs as far, as far back as 1934. And blues songs, right? Yeah, pretty much. Or 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 jump blues. Well, rock and roll really referred to sex more than it did music, right? Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, certainly, there was certainly a connotation there, uh, because all of the or a whole lot of those early hits, you know, were nothing but <laughs> metaphors for sex. Work with me, Annie. Annie. Yeah. Annie. <laughs> Did you ever meet Wolfman Jack? You know, I I didn't meet him. He he did stop by Kaysan once, but I think it was like a couple of months before I got there. So I never got to meet him, but uh been a fan, of course, for a long time. What was what was Tom Donahue like? Uh well, Tom had an imposing presence, you know, both physical and spiritual, and uh, he just kind of commanded the room, one of those kind of guys. He was probably an Egyptian emperor in a former life. (laughs) And it's not that he, you know, put on airs or anything. That's just the the image he carried around, and uh, and it was impressive. I, I don't know if I've run into... Many people in my life who who were that powerful. 
But he was the kind of guy that everyone liked, right? Uh, Not just well, we're scared of. I don't know. Uh, oh no. <laughs> I mean, I, well, I liked him. I I don't know. He he did he didn't always play it safe and took chances, and so he he may have uh, created some uh, enemies along the way. But I don't know. I don't know of any. I know he's held in in high regard now in the radio industry for what he accomplished at KSAN and KMPX. Okay, so what years did you work at KSAN? KSAN, I went there in in, the fall of 72, and I was there until um, the summer of 78. So you worked at night all the time, in the middle of the night? Uh, not all the time, but a lot of the time. And, you know, then for a while they had me coming in at 10 on a night or two a week and doing the 10 to 2 slot instead of the 2 to 6. Uh, and uh, it varied some. I, I, You know, I even did the morning show a few times when they were looking for a new host or something, but... Um, Pretty much, I, w- I was on at night. And then you worked at KSJO in San Jose. Yeah, they they bailed me out with the job after I got fired at KSAN. <laughs> <laughs> so, what did you fired um, for? Uh, well, um, oh, it was my big mouth, you know. They when uh, when the late seventies came in. KSAN started facing uh, more competition. There was Camel, and there were some other stations that were kind of eating away at the ratings. And, you know, around that same time, even though the station kept on moving for a while, the impact of Tom Donahue being gone really was uh, big and I think, you know, helped to contribute to the fall, let's say, of KSAN. Uh, so did so I answer you your question? So you ended up at, at KSJO, uh, and how long? Oh did yeah, you yeah, there? yeah. So um, uh, uh, they had, they called they started having meetings and uh, and uh, the management was not you know that tight with the people on the air in most cases and they started issuing some edicts and I remember coming in one night and. There were long stacks of records sitting on the floor in the record room that had been pulled out of our world-class library. You remember that, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I think there was like 30,000 albums in it, maybe. And so uh, when I found out what was going on, they were removing certain albums from airplay, or they wouldn't be available. And uh, so Sean Donahue and I um, came in one night, and every night I had noticed these stacks of records getting smaller and smaller. And uh, so Sean and I looked at each other one night, and we said, are we going to get any of these? (laughs) And so we finally got like an orange crate. I got uh, some good blues there, I remember. And then the rest of the records that were left went down in the basement where they stayed a while and uh, other people had access to them there. And I think what was finally left was eventually donated to uh, BAM archives, maybe. I'm not positive on that. So when did you start at KSJO in San Jose? Okay, well, that that was uh, a few months after I got fired. I keep forgetting to tell you why I got fired, but they (laughs) finally had a big programming meeting and called everybody in and and said that, well, they were going to make some changes and they were going to help us choose the music by pre-selecting certain tracks from certain albums that we would uh, that would be in the booth that we were to play. How generous uh, of them! <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, you know I could have kept quiet and probably stayed on another year or so, but I had to shoot off my mouth and I I stood up and said, "Well, you know I wasn't hired to do this, and I'm not going to do that." And 
then I got my notice, uh, I guess, on the next Friday that my services would no longer be required. <laughs> I'm sorry? So, so KSJO lets you do what you wanted to do? No, that was kind of a different job. I didn't really have a, a regular daily show or anything there. They hired me as a kind of production guy and promotion guy. And so I produced uh, spots, and I still hosted uh, for a while the KSGO ver- punk version of the punk show, The Outcasts. But other than that, uh, all my work down there was either special programming or, you know, production of some kind. Uh, at one point, we did something I, I was kind of proud of. I talked the manager and given me a a budget, and uh, we put together uh, what we called the Rock and Roll Circus. And it was kind of a caravan with the station van and a flatbed truck and some old antique cars. And we uh, we pulled up at, I think, 27 different towns along the peninsula, all the way from uh, Monterey to San Francisco. And we'd put on about a half hour show. We'd find, you know, find a plug and plug in. And I had a rock and roll trio, and uh, uh, we had a, a juggler and clowns, and we were giving out balloons and you know, CDs and all that kind of stuff. So it it worked out pretty good. Uh, uh, we had a f- few problems because the logistics put about 30 people working on this, but but it all ended well. And uh, shortly after we finished that, uh, they, the ratings went up and I got fired again. <laughs> <laughs> so what other stations did you work at? Um, well, let's see. A- after... Um, after that, I uh, took a job uh, to manage and program um, a big band station, KTIM, in San Rafael, which we called the Big Band Blend. And um, I got Bobby Dale, and uh, an expert on 20s and 30s jazz and popular music, as uh, my other two DJs, and I did a midday show, and it was just a daytime or so. Three guys could cover it, plus uh, some others on the weekend. And actually, I had Bob McClay working there for a while on the weekend. But uh, that that was a couple of years, and um, uh, at one point I went up to Portland and worked at a station there called Kissin', and then uh, when the city came along in uh, 86, maybe, was that when it started, about then, um, I, I signed on there as uh, the midday guy. The, it was 10 to 1 for a while, which was sweet, just a three-hour shift. <laughs> but then it ended up being t- a regular 10 to 2 daytime. And that lasted a couple of years. Until uh, the owners had to sell it for one reason or another, and that's when Jim Gabbert came in and uh, bought the station. <clears throat> and it had become really popular uh, in the city itself. The signal was not great, and so we didn't do that great in the ratings, which are taken over nine counties, I think. But, is this in um, Portland, or is this back in San Francisco? No, that was that was in San Francisco. Oh, you're back in San Francisco um, again. Yeah, yeah. From I think from eighty six to eighty eight, possibly eighty nine. No, it was eighty eight because then James Gabbard bought it and there was a a band of enthusiastic followers of the station that formed a group and and demanded that any new owner agree to continue the same format, which was kind of trying to be like k not quite, but kind of. And so he actually signed an agreement to do that, and he he uh, kept his word on that agreement for two whole hours. <laughs> 
Then he started calling Bonnie at the station, questioning what was being played, and you know, from there it just went downhill really fast. Uh, that was what coffee. station was that? What station was that? That was coffee, which is coffee. what the city became. It was sold to Gabbert, and he had coffee TV. You might yeah, there's recall, coffee which, TV I see all the time. It's some yeah, yeah. Well, he owned that, and so he wanted the radio holdings to have those call letters too. And so then, where'd you, you know, go from he, there? Well, he he right away within the first six months we were doing some nice shows. Tom O'Hare was there, and Bonnie Simmons, and Dave McQueen, and quite a bunch of the old uh, KSAM people. And uh, aesthetically, it was real good. And then he started, uh, you know, saying, we want more pop. We were programming to Frida in Hayward, who has bouffant blonde hair and and likes Neil Diamond or, or you know, <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> His concept of audience was, you know, kind of disrespectful by by our standards. And so... Four of us uh, refused to go along, Bonnie and Dan Daly and uh, uh, myself. And I, f- I forget who the other one was. And uh, we walked out. And then, uh, let's see, that would have been 89. Uh, you, sh- you sure you want to hear all of this track? Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I'm very interested. Okay, well, there's not too much left uh I was uh, there was supposed to be a new FM station opening up in Southern Oregon, and I was offered uh, uh, l- what looked like it would be a nice gig, to play what I want, and be there in a small town. And um, and so I came up and found that I had been misled, and they indeed did have a format and. <laughs> So that didn't work out, and but I hung out about a year up there, uh, making a living as I could. I started doing uh, my first blues show for a station in Medford, and uh, and uh, did some other stuff. And then in '92, um, my elderly parents were kind of where they could use some help, and so I came back to Boise and spent um, two, about three years here at that time and helped get a blues society started and um, had a couple of blues shows on the air here. And then um, I got married, and uh, my wife had a job offer up in Portland. So we went up we there married? and spent a couple of years. Is this I the first time at, we got married? No, second. <clears throat> oh, I thought so. You, you must have been at least 50 by then. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, at least. <laughs> okay, go um, ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let's see, where was I? Um, so we went to Portland and uh, did that thing. I, I did some work with the Cascade Blues Association up there. And then uh, my wife decided to try a new career in the airlines and took a course and got a job offer from Delta. And they had a number of different places we could go, L.A., Dallas, Cincinnati, and they also had Tampa. So we picked Tampa and went to Florida for a couple of years, Cool. which was my first foray very far east, so it was kind of an interesting experience. Did but you work then as a DJ we in so Florida? Did you work uh, as a DJ I was, I was producing my syndicated show by that time. I've been doing that like 20 years now, and I don't really hustle it. It's on uh, three or four broadcast stations and some Internet stations, and... <laughs> Mainly, it keeps me getting you know new releases, so I can keep up to date on all the new blues that's being recorded. So you're so, still doing that? Yeah. So so uh, let's see. After that, um, uh, I really oh yeah. For a couple of years, I was hired to do a blues show 
and a jazz show down in um, L.A. So I, I was in Long Beach. It was the <clears throat> Long Beach University Station. And I did that for a year, which was just long enough to know that we were always right about L.A. in San Francisco. <laughs> well, I was in L.A. for 12 years there, from 83 to 95. Well, so you I could take LA. it more than I could. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, so I came back to Idaho and, uh, um, oh, wait, I think I missed some place. Uh Oh, uh, I went to New Mexico for several years and lived on a farm 30 miles out of Taos and uh, got my show there on a local station. It still is on the station there. And uh, since then, you know, I've I've just been doing my blues show uh, syndicated, and I started a new one up here in Boise at KRBX, which is the community station. And I pretty much do it for fun these days, you know. Well, that's that's what you got to do. We got five minutes left, so where can they find you? Where can you find me? Okay, well, my uh, radio history is on a website called radiothrills.com. And um, the... Jive95.com is the the site a tribute to KSAN and has many posters and photographs and air checks and stuff. We're, we're right in the process of changing some of the audio, but if you like KSAN, you will like that site. And uh, let's see, that should cover it, huh? <laughs> so they can find you on Facebook just as Norman Davis, right? Yeah, they can too. Oh, you know, I didn't tell you one thing. Um, two or three, about two and a half years ago, I played a track by Big Mama Thornton, and it had a harmonica solo in it. So I wondered who that was, and I looked it up and found out it was her. And, really? You know? Yeah, and I thought, gee, you know, why aren't there more women that play the harmonica? So uh, it it piqued me, that question, which I never have really answered, but I ended up creating a website called (laughs) harmonicas.com, and we have there the most complete collection of women harmonica players in the world, and I'm happy to say that there's going to be an album coming out in a couple of months uh, that will be the first compilation of women blues harp players ever made. How about that? Okay, that's great. So we're out of time. Thank you uh, for being this has on been my fun. show. I haven't talked to you in years. I know. So we'll it's great you hearing up your on, voice. On Facebook or wherever. This is the girl, George, and the Dragons Radio Show saying, see you later, alligator. Everybody's crazy but me. Bye bye. Everybody's nutty as can be. Farming games, waging war, paint the names upon the door. You against me, us versus them. No communicado, don't give a damn. Our kids in the street are the gross casualties now. Everybody's crazy. Check our stuff, push the wrong button.